We're back with Rachel, who was treated with MDMA for her post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychiatrist Dr. Julie Holland, editor of Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, who is joining us via Polycom. And I want to share something with our viewers. Rachel, thank you for allowing us to share this. People are completely unaware of how this MDMA treatment is carried out. We're going to show you it for the first time. What you're about to see is something very private. It's very personal. Rachel has agreed to share this. In this video, she's under the effects of MDMA. This is when she said she had a breakthrough in her ability to trust and connect with people again. Let's take a look. Wow. I couldn't keep up or... Mm -hmm. Annie, Can we see how we can both have fears? Annie, our fears are dancing between us. Yeah. They're making art. Mm -hmm. They're out in the open running around. <laughs> right? Oh, God. That is so healing. Instead of holding us down. Oh, thank you so much. Mm. Well, thank you for starting it. You started that little flame dance. Oh my God, it feels so <laughs> wonderful to be with you right now. <laughs> and just to be, you, and I appreciate you sharing and with notice me. Who oh. star notice who started that. Me. Wow. That is, wow. It's, it's a little different than you thought it would be, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's not, a, it's not a party, it's hard work. But the medicine makes it so much easier, like Dr. I couldn't Holland was saying. But watch it and think, you felt so good, it was so magical. Does that then create this desire to call her? Be like, do you have any more? Can I do this again? I mean... I've never done recreational drugs and I never had a desire to. Mm -hmm. So that makes me, uh, you know, I'm not at risk anyway. But, sure. um, but uh, to my knowledge, the people coming out of the study have no need to go back. You get the value and it lasts. Wow, will you ever have to go through this again or does this usually last forever? Well, in my case, I had three sessions and, and that did the trick. Um, but it, like she said, it allowed me to deal with things that I had never been able to talk about wow. without re-traumatizing myself. Um, and then confront, almost do like brain surgery on myself, like you were saying, mm -hmm. rewire my own brain so that it filed the memories instead of relive the memories over and over and over again. And when I heard about your story and this use of MDMA in particular, of course, you're a little bit reticent, okay? Because you do not want to talk about something that is known as a party drug and give people license to use it. But I want to make it very clear that this is done in a clinical setting. These are trials in many ways. Dr. Holland, there's a specific dose given. Much of what we talk about when we talk about recreational use of these substances, you don't even know what you're taking, but most importantly, this truly is a treatment, and there's no part of this that is designed to be, oh, let's take a drug, get high, and have some fun. This is, this is a very, you're trying to get it spot on, right? So there will hopefully come a point in time where you know exactly how to use this in individual scenarios. Right. Uh, a few things. You know, in the medical model, you know exactly what you're getting. You know, you know it's MDMA. You know it's 125 milligrams, as opposed to at a rave or at a club where it could be absolutely anything. So the drug substitution makes recreational use much more risky. The other two issues are that in a club, uh, people are dancing for hours on end. They're getting overheated. There's a risk of heat stroke. And also, if you drink too much water with MDMA, you run the risk of overhydration. So in the medical setting, you're sitting down. You're speaking. You're drinking water only if, you know, just a little bit. Uh, so there's no risk of, of heat stroke or overhydration, which are real risks in the recreational model. This has really been going on all through the 70s and 80s where therapists, psychiatrists were giving it to their patients um, in private practice so that they could use catalysts to make psychotherapy, uh, you know, go faster and be easier and, you know, really have uh, profound results very quickly. They were using it with couples, with individuals, all through the 70s and 80s. And then uh, when ecstasy became illegal in the mid 80s, it really drove the use underground. So what happened now for the last 20 years uh, almost 30 years, is um, that the recreational use has exploded around the world, but psychiatrists and therapists haven't be, been able to use it because it's a Schedule One drug. Hey, I'm Dr. Travis Stork. Press here to subscribe to the Doctor's YouTube channel and press here to help reduce tension.